Denver at the tour stop of the Cradle of Fields tour and we're sitting here with Blake Judd from Nachtmistium. Hello. Nachtmistium. Name. Does it have any meaning? Kind of. Uh, Nacht is German for night and then uh, Mistium is a attempt at a Latin phrase which means encompassing darkness. I came up with it when I was 16 years old so it's just kind of stuck for all those years. Now you started a band in 2000 and at what age did you pick up your first instrument and why? Which, whichever one you choose, why did you choose that particular? Um, uh, first instrument was a guitar and I believe I got my first guitar when I was about eight years old. Um, I got an acoustic and then when I was 13, which was around 1995 I think, I bought a, or I got my first electric guitar and uh, started playing seriously when I was about 16. And I started Nocturnistium when I was 17. So that's just been the instrument that I always felt most comfortable with playing. All my heroes are guitar players, so. Are you endorsed right now? Yeah, we have a Gibson endorsement, but I, I don't play Gibsons anymore, honestly. I used to, I'm back to BC Rich guitars, so we haven't really hunted out an endorsement with them. I mean, I suppose we could look into it, but I have a couple guitars that I really like, so I don't really need an, an endorsement right now because I've got everything I need. Um, your vocals are pretty clear when you sing and these days this is not very often. How important is it for you as a vocalist that your words are heard in the songs? Um, it's become more relevant on the last couple records for sure. Um, I think uh, Instinct Decay was our last full length from a, which was 2005 where uh, I didn't really go out of my way to enunciate things and um, once we started working with Sanford Parker and recording in larger studios um, I uh, really wanted to make sure that the lyrics were coming across because one thing that people that don't like this kind of music generally complain about is that they can't understand the words so I'm not going to stop delivering a harsh vocal performance but I would like to at least you know make what we're saying audible and understandable so I work on that in live. I, I feel that I've got it down pretty good at this point. Now, um, as with every band these days, you went through tons of lineup changes. How hard is it for you to find musicians that share your vision, A, and B, that are willing and able to tour? Um, it, well, that, that's been the hurdle. You know, I read a lot of things online, like forums and places like that, where people are like, oh, Blake Judd must be a huge asshole because you can't keep a lineup. That's not the case. I mean, I can be an asshole, don't get me wrong, but um, generally it, it's the result of people being unable to deal with being on the road as much as we are. Either they just can't do it because of obligations at home, mortgages, jobs, wives, children, all of those things have been an issue um, with certain individuals over the years. And then, yeah, you have to be able to get along with the people, be out for five, six, seven weeks at a time, in close quarters and be able to deal with each other and musicians are all especially when you get into the world of extreme music or extreme musicians have extreme personalities generally so to try to find a group of people who all communicate well with each other and um, you know we can all deal with each other's quirks has been a challenge but um, the lineup we have right now has been great we haven't had a single real issue at all with the group of people playing on this tour the core of which myself uh, Andrew Margashevsky, our other guitarist, and uh, Charlie Fell, our drummer. Uh, the three of us have been on tour together for, we've played over 150 shows together in the last year. So, um, and we've had no problems either, you know, and Sanford Parker and Will Lindsay, who were on Addicts, both started touring with us this year. And uh, we have no issues with those guys either. And we all know each other from home and we get along really well. So it's, it's a really kind of peaceful environment for us. Uh, between each other, which is really important and allows us to function as a unit much better. There's no infighting, so it's really good right now. You mentioned Sanford Parker. He is part of your touring lineup. Yeah. How does that affect or enhance your uh, live performance with him on stage? Oh, uh, it's really different. Um, it sounds a lot more like the records, that's for sure. Uh, the last couple, anyways. Um, we performed before only twice with uh, people playing synthesizers since we started really utilizing them in our records. Um, and when I say twice, I mean two individual performances. Once at home with a, a friend of mine named Matthias Vogels who plays in a band called Murmur. He helped us out one time and then um, a tune from Astrosonic filled in for us at Roadburn. And um, 
you know, those were those shows were great. We were really excited and happy to have that going on on stage. But neither of those people were potentially permanent uh, members of the band. So uh, Sanford has expressed the willingness to tour with us, but he has a great job at home recording bands and makes good money doing it. So for for us to pull him away from that, obviously we need to be able to compensate him in a way that is comparable on some level to what he makes at home. And right. we on a tour like this, we're able to do that. So it allows us to bring him with, and he adds a, just an amazing dynamic to the show and he's a great performer and he's just a he's a good guy to have on tour you know off stage he's very very helpful and very reliable and useful in terms of just being a, a good good trooper on the road so yeah it's, it's really cool to have him out with us cool. now uh, your current set list you play only songs from black metal part one and two is the main reason because addicts you never played live or is that just the songs you want to bring on that tour um, a little of both. Uh, we are playing stuff from the Doomsday Derelict EP too, which came out in between uh, Assassins and Addicts. But um, the, the it was an EP, so I didn't count. No, it. no, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> but uh, we are we are playing that stuff in there. But um, no, the main I mean, there's a couple reasons for it. I mean, first we have Sanford with us, so we're gonna play our stuff where we use synthesizers. And to uh, Assassins was never really properly toured for. I mean, we did go out and tour, but we didn't do as much as we should have. I broke my leg at one point and had to miss a full European tour, a full US tour, uh, during kind of the peak time for us to have been out touring on that record. So I'm still incorporating a lot of that album into our set list. And, and you know, people like it too. It was one of the first records that really caught on with people aside from the, the small underground community that had been aware of us for years before that. But, um, in Addicts, we just haven't played that stuff live really yet. We didn't have, we recorded the album in January of last year, and by the middle of February, we went on tour and did not stop touring until October. So we never really had time to learn the stuff as a live band. And um, and a lot of it is, you know, really necessary for Sanford to be with us, bringing the, the synthesizers and things to the those songs. So uh, that's why we've waited to do it until now. So now, I, like this year is the first official like tour cycle for Addicts, in my opinion where we're going to focus primarily on playing that record and then stuff from Assassins as well. Now, how do the Cradle of Phil's fans react to your stuff? So far, it's been really positive, actually. Um, you know, I mean, I would say, well, what do you just think it's fair to say half the crowd is really fired up? Yeah, I mean, if not more, you know, I mean, and a lot of these people don't know who we are. You know, occasionally when I'm talking with the, the crowd between the songs, I'll be like, you know, how many of you out there actually knew who we were before tonight? And you'll hear, you know, You'll hear a, a, a percentage of the crowd here, but it's not everybody. But then it's like, and how many of you are enjoying what you're seeing tonight? And the whole crowd will roar. So right. it's cool. You know, people are people seem into it. Our merch sales certainly reflect that people are, are checking the stuff out. So it's been good so far. We're, we're a flexible band. We can tour with a band like Cradle of Filth, but we can tour with a band like I Hate God or someone as well and still kind of fit the bill. We're always the odd band out, but it seems to work. So yeah. I can't complain at all. This has been a good run for us. Good. Now, a couple albums ago, you ventured away from black metal and went into a different musical direction. Mm -hmm. Why? Oh, I just, I've got a lot of black metal that I've put out, you know, or our, our idea of what black metal was anyways. Um, with, you know, Reign of the Malicious, their self-titled EP, Demise, Instinct Decay, the World Fall EP. There's a lot of optimistic material out there that is just straight black metal. And, um, my tastes have strayed from, you know, I still love black metal music, but um, I listen to a lot of other things and I also realize it's just a genre where there's a lot of people kind of repeating themselves and not to say anyone's good or bad at it, but it's certainly not an area where you can be particularly creative because the foundation has kind of been laid to what true black metal is. And if you step outside of that formula, you're pretty much stepping away from being a black metal band. Um, so out of respect for the genre we just won't tag ourselves as that but that's still where you know our the foundation of our music is definitely a black metal foundation and um that's definitely like the the genre the band was based on when it was built and, and initiated so uh you know everything just kind of happened for a reason and i i never wanted to be a band that just kind of sat on the shelf with everybody else you know i wanted to stand out whether people liked it or not is irrelevant it's been positive that they have but um you know, I don't ever want to make something that I've heard before. I want to make an album that when I put it in my record collection, it's something different than what's already there. That's always been my goal, so that's what I try to do. You said in an interview, black metal to me always represents freedom. Be your own leader. So what 
is the current black metal scene in the U.S. for you? How? What is the health of it? Oh, I, or you know, I, I'm so busy with my own band and touring and stuff. Like, I don't really, I don't pay attention to a whole lot that's going on that's coming out right now. I kind of like when I'm home, I listen to my records that I already own and. Um, you know, I meet more bands touring than anything else, and we haven't toured with a lot of black metal bands lately. I think 2007 or 8 was the last time we went out with a proper black metal lineup, so um, uh, I really don't know what's going on. There's certainly bands I like, I enjoy bands like Inquisition, and, um, I like uh, Andrew, our other guitarist, has a project called Avicii, who has an album coming out on Profound Lore, I'm really into that. Um, Obviously, I like the material created by the people I play in Twilight with. Uh, Krieg has a new album out that I really enjoy. I love Leviathan and Lurker of Chalice and bands like that. So, you know, there's plenty of good black metal in the United States, but uh, I can't say that I'm completely up to speed on what the okay. the newest, hottest band on the market is. <laughs> now, Life at Roadburn came out yesterday. Mm -hmm. And you guys recorded that in uh, Tilburg at the Roadburn Festival. Mm -hmm. How did that come to life? Because Roadburn Records is releasing that right now, and yeah. you guys are still on Century Media. Right. Want to um, talk about that? We we have um, we're only on Century Media in North America. We're actually on Candlelight in Europe, um, and I've I've specifically set up our deals where we have freedom to do things like let road. You know, if we record a festival or record a live performance at a festival, and those promoters happen to have a record label and are willing to invest in and release um, the quality pressing on CD or vinyl, preferably vinyl for us. Um, so it only comes out on vinyl or on no, CD also? It'll be out on CD later, but the vinyl was our, that's what I was concerned about. The CDs, the label can technically do it, so they're going to. All I cared about was the vinyl coming out. Um, and we. Uh, we have the freedom to work with, with people like that in situations like that. I've designed our, our deals with our record labels to be very flexible so that we can still kind of participate in typical underground type of releases and DIY stuff. We don't want to be exclusive to this um, more professional corporate kind of um, record label approach that a lot of these labels have in terms of how they release, market, and distribute their music. So it's nice to have some freedom to do that. And, um, you know, when Roadburn offered up to release the recording, uh, I said, you know, absolutely, of course you can. You guys were the people that put it all together, and they worked really hard. Um, we we showed up to that festival as a three-piece and played as a five-piece. We had yeah, Tune from Astrosonic and uh, and Ron Van Herpen from The Devil's Blood played for, uh, guitar and synth for us, so that we could do something very special at Roburn, and it went really, really well too. It was actually pretty remarkable. We had three hours of rehearsal as a full band. We'd never even met those guys. And they were so prepared that um, we delivered what was up to, at that point, the best set we'd ever played. So uh, I was really happy it was recorded the way it was. It was multi-tracked, so it was mixed at a studio later. And uh, it just came out fantastic. And then um, they they had someone they know design a layout for the LP that went with the art direction and kind of visual ideas that we had suggested to them. And it came out, it just, uh, the whole package came out excellent. So we're really happy about it. Um, you recorded a video, um, Every Last Drop, from your last album. Now this track is by far the longest of the album. Why did you choose that track to make a video? Um, it was a, There was a numerous reasons for it. Um, first and foremost, I wanted a storyline music video. I didn't want to be a band playing in our rehearsal room with a budget, you know, a bunch yeah. of different camera angles and things move around fast, but that's not a music video to me. A music video should be like a short film. And um, that's what we wanted to do. So naturally, we needed more than four minutes to, to make that happen, for one. And um, the label was really into the idea that to Century Media Finance, the majority of that, and the people we spoke to over there, um, my, my primary uh, person I deal with at that label was very enthusiastic about using that song once I described the, uh, the idea I had as far as what the storyline would be and how it would go from there. And, uh, which was further adapted by Jimmy Hubbard and Selden Hunt, who were the directors of the video. They really kind of took my loose idea and turned it into a storyline and created characters and so forth. So it was really neat how it, how it all came together and everybody that was involved in it had a lot to do with like the creative result. Um, it wasn't just one of us or myself that, that put that all together. It was a group of people that did it. So it was a neat, neat project to work on with some very talented people. Now, Bruce Lamont also did guest vo or vocals on that track, and he also performed in it. What is your relationship with Bruce? Uh, he's just a very, very dear friend of mine from home. Um, 
he and I both worked at a club together. He still works there. I worked there for about a year um, called The Empty Bottle, which is right in our neighborhood. It's a very well-respected um, independent music venue in the city that gets a lot of great shows of all types of genres. Um, and I know him from there, and uh, obviously his band Yakuza as well. We used to practice in a room right next to them 10 years ago, so I've known those guys for a really long time. So he's just a really talented and available person who uh, is always willing to come in and, and do some stuff. He likes to work with his friends, so we always like to have him in. Now, uh, Yakuza and also Led Zeppelin too, his other project, mm -hmm. um, is uh, both uh, from Chicago. So a lot of bands are from Chicago. How is the Chicago metal scene? Oh, it's great there. There's, a, there's so many bands and um, just a really good group of, like a core group of people in the neighborhood I live in especially, which is where uh, everyone in this band lives, all probably within a mile or so of each other, I would say. And uh, every other band that we're affiliated with in any way, shape, or form, for the most part, in Chicago also lives in that same area. So yeah. it's a really closely knit community. We all drink in the same bars. We go to the same restaurants. We see each other all the time. So it's a, it's a cool and, uh, and fun place to live right now. And there's a lot happening. So I'm real happy with it. Um, now, I heard you say that you will not record a, a Black Metal Part 3. Uh, what is your next direction going to be and are you writing for it already? Yeah, we're already writing for it. Um, we're going to return to form a little bit. There's going to be a lot more of a direct black metal foundation. Um, but at the same time, we're going to take some of the other ideas that we've used, especially on addicts, and kind of push forward with them. I, I'd, I'd imagine expect something that sounds like a combination of uh, Burzum and Ministry something like that there you go that's kind of what we're going for so cool. it's going to be a lot more aggressive um but it'll still have the same kind of catchy elements but we're going to make a lot more aggressive of a record i think nice. so what's next for nacht mysticum other than blake is getting married this year yes i am i'm getting married in june um so i've got that to look forward to and then uh other than that, we are, uh, we're playing uh, in Chicago on June 11th. We're playing the Ale Horn of Power Festival as a direct support to Orange Goblin. They're headlining, which I think is great. They're an awesome band. Um, so we're doing that at home. And then in July, we travel down to Central Illinois for the Central Illinois Metal Fest, which has been going on for probably five or six years now, at least, if not longer. And the turnout's pretty good. It's like 1,500 to 2,000 people, I think. So uh, that'll be fun. It's close and easy for us to go to. And then uh, in August, we're playing Party Sand Festival outside of... It's outside of Berlin, right? No, or, I think... I have no clue. I'm not sure. It's some... 100 kilometers outside yeah. of Berlin? Okay. So, yeah, we're, we're going over there for that. There might be some other European festivals, but I'm kind of leaving my summer open due to my uh, other engagement in my personal life. Oh. So uh, that's the plan for now. And then uh, most likely we'll be out on the road again, either in the U.S. or Europe sometime in September or October. Any headlining tourist plans so far? No, we did one last September. Um, right now, I'm not really planning on doing that. Like, if we do go out again this year, this Cradle of Phil tour is so monolithic, it's covering every possible place we could need to go in the United States. So the only way I really see us touring here again this year would be in the event that we are offered another direct support mm -hmm. slot or something similar with a, with a very large band that's going to put us in front of crowds that we haven't played to this year already. Um, so we'll see if that happens. It's either that or we'll go to Europe. And we, there's been talks of doing a headlining tour in Europe. So uh, we're, we'll just kind of see. I, I don't have anything set in stone yet. Now, um, <clears throat> kind of weird question. Do you guys get like um, not that many offers because of your past affiliation with a Nazi label? Or this is totally blown over? No, that's totally blown over at this point. I think people have realized that we don't have any affiliation with that. The only time that's ever been an issue was with the Scion Festival. And that's such a huge corporate thing. Right. And it turned out that it was some little black metal fan who didn't like us that wrote to the label. Or wrote, I'm sorry, wrote to Toyota and brought that all to a head. That wasn't them doing research. That was somebody intentionally trying to sabotage us in a situation where such a large company was involved that it was obviously going to stir things up for them. Gotcha. And uh, out of respect for the people that are over there that, you know, I mean, we don't want to be causing trouble for anybody either. So right. um, 
that whole situation it seems to have come to a, a close though finally which is really good and nice. it's about time because we've right. never really had anything to do with any of that so right. but it comes with the territory it's extreme music and extreme music draws extreme reactions from people sometimes and that's that's to be expected that's right. so. okay now the famous last words um thanks to anyone who's watching this and thank you for the interview thank you you're very welcome we are not your leaders